Welcome everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Why and How Care Coordinators Must Evolve. I'm Home Health Care News Editor Bob Holly, and I'll be your moderator. I'll kick, kick things off with a couple of housekeeping items before I introduce our expert speaker for today. Uh, before I do that, I just wanted to note that this discussion is made possible by Schedulo, so a huge thank you to them for making this webinar possible. Uh, as for those housekeeping items, for starters, please note that your audio has been muted to ensure sound quality. If you have a question, please send them our way using the question function on your screens. Uh, just to go over that one more time, we can't hear you. Your audio lines are muted, but we do want to get your questions. So make sure you type those uh, to, to us throughout the webinar and we'll answer as many as we can toward the end of the conversation. This webinar is being recorded. All attendees will receive a copy of the webinar and the slides once everything wraps up. That's either going to come from HHCN or Schedulo, so just be on the lookout for that. Without further ado, let's go ahead and meet our expert panelists for today, our expert speaker. Michael Gleason currently serves as Director of Product Marketing at Schedulo, where he helps serve the evolving need for deskless productivity and champions the 2.7 billion strong deskless workforce. That's a number uh, that obviously grew a lot in the past 12 months, I'm sure. Outside of work, Michael enjoys his lifelong passion of playing music and getting outdoors for hikes, climbs, and rides of all kinds. Michael, thanks for your time today. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for joining. We can hop right into today's agenda. It's a rainy day here in San Francisco, so let's try and warm things up and have a little fun. Um, so, uh, Bob started with some housekeeping. I have a few more items to go through. Then we're going to talk about the home care landscape and our top challenges within that space. I'm also going to showcase some innovators in the space that I've been fortunate enough to speak to and work with. And then we'll make sure to wrap up with some takeaways and leave time for Q&A at the end. So as good a place to start as any is with a few housekeeping notes. As Bob was kind enough to mention, you've got questions, we've got answers. So Q&A is actively encouraged, not just encouraged, but actively encouraged. Um, so type questions in any time. If we don't get to your question at the end, we'll certainly follow up. Speaking of following up, our people will call your people. We will follow up with the slide deck. So by all means, take screenshots, but just know we will get you a copy promptly after the webinar. And then last but certainly not least, use our findings to your advantage, whether that's challenging the status quo within your organization, justifying a project, or even being so bold as to ask for headcount. At the end of the day, these are tough challenges we're trying to solve. And gosh darn it, you don't have to do it alone. Uh, briefly, very briefly, we'll talk a little bit about Schedulo, just so you know where we're coming from. So Schedulo offers the Deskless Productivity Cloud, which at the end of the day is about empowering you to better manage, engage, and analyze your deskless workforce. As you can see here on the right, you couldn't miss it if you tried. We work with a number of organizations across a wide range of verticals, uh, but especially in the healthcare space, and more notably for this conversation today in the home healthcare space. Of all the things on this humble brag slide, perhaps my favorite is the one in the bottom left around the cloud project of the year, where we were recognized for the work we did with bioreference laboratories. If you're not familiar with bioreference laboratories, they're a labs and diagnostics firm based out of the East Coast, and they were tasked with standing up a COVID-19 testing operation for the greater New York area. And we're proud to have worked with them to stand up over 1.4 million COVID tests. So when you talk about high scale, high performance, and perhaps more importantly, a high stakes use case, uh, it doesn't get any more significant than that. So really humbled to have an opportunity to contribute to an effort like that. If you want to be a little less abstract, a little more specific, what is it you actually do? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, here on the left, you can see what an intake coordinator, for instance, in the home care space would see working out of our web application day in and day out to manage the Rubik's Cube of work to be done, employees to match uh, with those jobs, skill requirements, geographic considerations, et cetera. And then of course the care providers on the right side would actually use our mobile application on iOS or Android on a daily basis to navigate to work, execute work, get work details, communicate amongst themselves and back to headquarters, et cetera. So with that out of the way, uh, it's generally our perspective here that deskless workers are considerably underserved. And then, in fact, when you think of the mobile workforce, it outnumbers folks like me four to one. In fact, 80% of the global workforce is deskless, 
yet only 1% of the venture capital raised that's invested in software is invested in software that actually helps these uh, deskless workers, as you can see. And as a result, existing approaches tend to fall short. So Schedulo's mission in life is really to champion these deskless workers, try to abstract the complexity and make their life a little easier. Now, with that as a jumping off point, I think it's an opportunity to dive into the home care landscape and the top five challenges we face within that space. As good a place as any to start would be simply what we know to be true. Uh, in 2020, the home health care space or home care space was pegged at $167 billion, which is certainly nothing to sneeze at. But perhaps most notably, it's actually growing at nearly 10% year over year, which is quite a clip, particularly if a market for a market of that size. And certainly stating the obvious here, but we also know that 100% of our lives have been impacted substantially by COVID-19. A lot of the threats that are facing home care providers are some of the old familiar usual suspects, and specifically things around caregiver shortages, thinning margins, and in fact a trend around increasing demand for higher wages among those caregivers. Caregiver turnover and attrition is a major issue, and we'll get into that a bit more. Also challenges in attracting enough referrals continues to be uh, an obstacle for a lot of home care providers, as well as increasing competition um, in an increasingly competitive landscape. Those layer on top of some of the more specific challenges we see when we work with folks in the home care space. Obviously we come at it through the lens of scheduling, but things um, that kind of orbit scheduling in concentric circles, you could think of the staff experience, and to follow up on that attrition remark, in fact, it's not atypical to see 40 to 60% of your caregiver workforce turnover every year. And that's a lot of wisdom, talent, skill, and cost that's walking out the door. We also know the client experience is a challenge and it's always a struggle to consistently meet all of their preferences, particularly at scale. There's appointment inefficiencies that need to be managed as well. From a commuting and travel standpoint, many of the organizations we've spoken to were trying to figure out a better way to route plan, and there's often suboptimal sub route planning. And we know that caregivers need flexibility and predictability simultaneously, and there's essentially a missed opportunity to optimize for both staff and patients there using a lot of the existing approaches. Communication, always a challenge, but particularly in home care, and that's not only between the office or headquarters and field, but also between folks in the field and other folks in the field, and then even with the external parties like, um, like your clients or patients. <clears throat> and then there's an ever-evolving regulatory landscape to be addressed. So things like the patient-driven group memo that's impacting how providers are reimbursed, and reimbursement will be a theme we dive into later in the presentation, as well as electronic visit verification all have to be considered and dealt with. What's fascinating to us is that despite all of this uncertainty, there continues to be growth in mobile staff. And in fact, we did a study last year and we found that despite all of the economic headwinds and uncertainty in 2020, 62% of organizations, nearly two thirds, anticipated growth in their deskless workforce in the next year or two. Only 4% expect a reduction. So we know life is challenging and you have more folks coming in the door that you need to train and manage. And this sets the stage for us to have the conversation around the crux of today's content, which is really around the top challenges and flip side opportunities we see in the home care space. And we're really fortunate to have worked with a number of folks in the home care space and aggregate their insights and information and try to reflect that back to this audience today. So we're gonna talk through things like the new telehealth reality, caregiver enablement, reimbursement, which is always a challenge, navigating communication hurdles, and lastly, data access and interoperability. So starting things off with challenge one, the new telehealth reality. Of course, the reality is that providers need to reach patients anywhere. And in fact, the prevalence of telehealth continues to grow and that should be no surprise to anyone on the call today. In fact, over the last several years, there's been a seven fold increase in telehealth services. And depending on where you look for statistics, telehealth grew nearly 65% in the aggregate in 2020 or if you look at uh, organization to organization, somewhere between 50 and 150% growth in telehealth services were experienced. There's also logistical challenges and learning curves with this brave new world. Not only do staff and patients need to feel comfortable with the technology, they need to answer questions like, how do we maintain quality of care and bedside manner over video? 
And you on the operations or logistics side or care coordinator or intake side need to think about how do we operationalize and incorporate it in our practice flow? How do we schedule it? Who handles what? But rather than just bemoan all the challenges we're facing, there's an opportunity for each one of these to look at the flip side and the opportunity. So if we do that for the telehealth world, we know that providers need to reach patients anywhere and the two opportunities we see around that are one, embracing the transition to telehealth. And while that may be stating the obvious, we do talk to organizations across a wide range or spectrum of maturity in that regard. And then two, to take advantage of the regulatory changes that I imagine we're familiar with. So we know that in 2019 and 2020, there were shifts and particularly in 2020 with COVID, there were emergency shifts and regulatory changes that have been broadened uh, or that have broadened the services that patients could use to connect with doctors. So we know that landscape is changing and we have the wind at our backs to embrace that new reality. The second challenge worth calling out here is around caregiver enablement, and this is quite simply equipping staff with the resources to deliver quality care. The unfortunate reality is for many of us, logistics are in the way, and this logistical minutia distracts and drains caregivers. And I often think of caregivers as having a finite amount of energy. And at the end of the day, we want to translate as much of that as possible into providing care. And every logistical drain, workflow, hoop they have to jump through, complexity, that's just uh, distracting or draining that energy that could be better spent translated to providing care and ultimately differentiating your service in the marketplace. We also know that caregivers simply want data and they particularly want it on mobile. We often hear that jumping between systems and manual processes doesn't work, but perhaps more interestingly, 90% of healthcare providers are using mobile devices within their organizations to engage patients in care. However, a lot of the solutions in the space have yet to catch up. So we know a mobile first approach or a mobile friendly approach ends up being a caregiver friendly approach, which ultimately means it's a patient or client friendly approach. And then lastly, there's been a major theme in the discussion around mobile uh, home care and healthcare around autonomy, and specifically autonomy for caregivers to deliver care on their terms. And time and time again, empowerment and autonomy rank high for caregivers and employment satisfaction factors. And if we put two and two together, we can recognize that attrition is a major challenge in the home health care space. We also know that empowerment and autonomy uh, rank high for caregivers in those employment satisfaction considerations. So it comes simply to the fact that we need to make life simpler for caregivers. And that dovetails nicely, dovetails nicely with the opportunity side of the conversation, where you can think more specifically about caregiver enablement. And the two things to note here are first, it's about allowing caregivers to focus on the care, and that could be investing in systems or simply processes that allow caregivers to focus on that care. It also comes down to offering autonomy, and that autonomy could be about things like the types of patients they work with, as well as when and how they provide care and making that process to accept work, to shuffle work a little more smooth. Third challenge we're going to flag is really around reimbursement. And this is old hat for those of us in the home care space, but we know reimbursement continues to be a challenge. And the two considerations here are first, parity and reimbursement between virtual and in-person visits. The reality is the payer versus provider struggle to set reimbursement rate continues. And ultimately we know that uniformity is what we need to provide virtual services. Similarly, the payer versus provider discussion begs the question, if payers and providers are motivated by different incentives, how do they come to terms? Now, there is some good news here and the three things to call out around the same rate for telehealth appointments, emergency policies, and the fact that some considerations do persist. So when we think about the same rate for telehealth appointments consideration, we know that healthcare providers are now allowed to be reimbursed for virtual visits at the same rate as they are for in-person appointments, which is huge in removing one of the major barriers to telehealth. Of course, that means more vendors, more folks are getting into the telehealth space. Um, so it's a bit of a foot race, but it is an opportunity uh, to innovate and uh, differentiate. From an emergency policy standpoint, we also know that almost all states have issued emergency policies in response to COVID to make telehealth services not only available, but more accessible and simple to execute. As noted though, considerations do persist and we know there's a lack of parity in licensing as well as payment parity at the state level and private insurer offerings typically vary quite a bit as well. The next generation of reimbursement is going to require a leveling off 
So it's something we're going to have to continue to think about as we move through 2021 in this brave new world where telehealth is considerably more common. Fourth challenge to call out here is really around communication hurdles, and that's both real-time real internal communication as well as real-time external communication. We know change management is important, and if we accept that agility is key, particularly to differentiate in an ever-crowded home health market, how do we evolve from a reactive posture to a proactive posture? A lot of communication that may be ad hoc or via text, email, or phone today needs or begs to be centralized. We also know, particularly in this era, that clear, consistent, and apolitical communication around medical uh, insights must uh, occur, and that communication must support that strategy. And then on a related note, managing misinformation becomes a challenge. How do we, as an industry, combat misinformation if it's weighted equally with truth? We know that communication difficulties are widely considered the cause of a vast majority of medical mishaps, and perhaps most dramatically, it can lead to unintended consequences in the extreme. The opportunity here is both around consolidation and then actually looking from communication as a weakness and then turning it into a strength and potentially a differentiator on the external front. So from a consolidation standpoint, a lot of the organizations I've been speaking to are talking about looking for one system for cross-functional communication. And that's not just communication between headquarters and the field, but it's also from field staff directly to other field staff. And then the flip side of that, external communication with your clients or patients can be a differentiator. And we're gonna breathe a bit of life into that when we actually get to some of the um, innovator snapshots. But we know that communication could potentially be an opportunity to differentiate through superior interaction with customers. And that unfolds across the domains of not only frequency, but also consistency and transparency. The fifth challenge we'd like to flag is really around data access and interoperability. We know that access to critical data is critical, and we know it's all about facilitating uh, the continuity of care, maintaining the continuity of care, and reducing errors. And that lack of data accessibility is simply unacceptable and potentially devastating. And at the most extreme, if we want to be uh, a bit dramatic about it, we know that data mix-ups can lead to medical errors. And in fact, 44% of medical error deaths at the most extreme, are preventable. We know that data accessibility, communication, transparency, speed of information being conveyed, all factors in there. We also know that manual information gathering eats up time. And if data doesn't automatically sync between systems, you're adding manual work not only on the behalf of your intake coordinators, but also care providers, which to me comes back to that concept I've been discussing with some folks in the home care space around diluting their impact or if any caregiver gets a finite amount of output or care to provide, how do, we, um, how do we make sure as much of that as possible is translated to your clients or patients, not lost in the tactical minutia of having to access data or juggle between systems? Of course, the opportunity there is really around quality, safety, efficiency, and efficacy of healthcare delivery through accurate and accessible data. Sometimes that's breaking down silos, sometimes that's just having conversations, sometimes that's developing or defining new processes, and occasionally it can be an investment in uh, additional technologies, although it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. We also know that increased access leads to greater efficiency of care, and in fact, there's an opportunity to collectively educate, predict, and prevent challenges before they arise. And again, we'll breathe some more life into that when we start talking about this in action in the context a few of the organizations I've been speaking to. Speaking of which, we now have an opportunity to showcase some of the innovators in the space. Uh, and as great a place to start as any would be around Easter Seals. So if you're not familiar with Easter Seals and where we've specifically uh, been talking to the organization based out of the Northern California area, they've been leading the way to ensure individuals and families affected by disabilities can live, learn, work, and play to their full potential. The organization's aim is to expand access and affordability for services in the lives of children with disabilities and, also importantly, their families. They have about 400 mobile practitioners, which contribute to about 6,000 monthly appointments. And I'm going to highlight a few of the transformations and key innovations they went through. And this is less about Schedulo and more about a digital transformation journey that Easter Seals set off on when they decided to reinvent uh, the approach essentially for managing their mobile workforce, taking in uh, appointment requests and onboarding patients and managing 
the process of allocating uh, mobile practitioners to those clients and patients. And the three transformations they were really targeting were around visibility, predictability, particularly for patients, and better care and service. When they were speaking to me about visibility, they specifically called out the importance of tracking and the accessibility of patient appointments, caregivers, and visit status. A lot of organizations we speak to are managing this uh, through some kind of manual ad hoc fashion, lots of complicated spreadsheets, a whole team of individuals, some whiteboards that look like they're straight out of Goodwill hunting, uh, in short, pretty complicated. So they wanted to simplify that and in part, uh, or as a result, get better visibility. They also wanted to offer patients higher predictability. These patients and patient families are certainly dealing with enough. So the importance of real-time availability updates was critical. And ultimately that gives the families they work with reassurance and most importantly, reduces stress. And then when it comes to better care and service, it was really about ensuring that patients' preferences are respected when matching practitioners to families. And this is perhaps the most human uh, piece of the equation. If there's a child that's triggered by a particular type of therapist or responds better to a particular type of therapist, that's important. We've heard anecdotes about um, patients and patient families that have particular preferences about the type of stimulation that they require or the type of stimulation you need to avoid when performing behavioral therapy or type of toy they may like and that that can break, make or break an appointment and be the difference between making progress and potentially breakthroughs versus not. Uh, there's also some key innovations worth calling out here. And it was particularly around specialized matching of behavioral health practitioners to match patients' sensitive needs, as we just discussed. There's also more practical considerations around things like uh, language, for instance, uh, or time of day. Managing patient appointments in multiple locations, both in and out of home, was critical. Maintaining consistency of care between appointments was important increasingly difficult in the age of COVID and another opportunity for telehealth, which we spoke about earlier. And last but not least, eliminating the combination of electronic records, manual paperwork, and other disparate systems. Before and after picture, or the snapshot here really tells the story uh, more thoroughly. So briefly, just summarizing, we know that before coordinators essentially managed the entire process of scheduling and managing uh, care through extremely large and elaborate spreadsheets using Outlook, they were on the phone all the time, and constantly having to deal with cancellations and ultimately reschedule requests throughout the workday, which is not only different for the operational staff or the intake coordinators, but also difficult for the folks receiving the care and their family. And it was incredibly dynamic and frustrating and paper-based. Now, of course, the after picture, and again, this isn't just about schedule, this is really about a mindset shift within their organization and a decision to step up and digitally transform their operations was really about the way they can better match people to cases using a variety of skills and matching factors, essentially think about tagging attributes or skills to particular employees and then better allocating them to patient and client families accordingly. It's also more practical things like being able to factor in travel time between jobs or being able to keep all of that scheduling information electronically live in real time and visible both to folks in, the, in headquarters as well as folks out in the field. We also know that just being able to know that a practitioner is going to be there with a client in a reliable and predictable way takes a lot of the stress away from clients and the client's families. One other story to share before we head over to some of the wrap ups and key takeaways and an opportunity to turn some of this into action for everyone is around Solace Pediatric Home Health Care. And Solace Home Health Care provides in-home pediatric nursing, occupational, physical, and speech language therapy services for children from birth to 18 years of age. And I love uh, talking to the folks who are over at Solace because they really see themselves as a change agent and innovator in the space. They have about 150 mobile workers and their transformation targets were really around employee empowerment, which goes back to the challenges we previously flagged around attrition. Um, and that comes to things like incentivizing clinicians with features such as work offers, which essentially gives them the ability to more dynamically or in real time respond to work, accept work, decline work, and gives them a level of flexibility and autonomy that they otherwise would not have. Also things like better patient details, um, and better patient service through capturing patient details and continually personalizing visits. Uh, in fact, I believe Solace was the one I heard the story about uh, making a note in Schedule around a child's preferences for their favorite toy. And that just gets to the heart of the human element here. And then logistically improved operations, unifying scheduling with an EMR to eliminate that disparate system and paper trail and having to double produce work across different systems. Uh, 
perhaps most interestingly, in addition to just less time with paperwork and more time with patients and their families, Solace realized an 84% reduction in patient no-shows. Now you'd think, if I'm coming to your house to deliver care or behavioral therapy, where do you have to hide? But in reality, people are busy and manual notifications or voicemails, things can slip through the cracks. So they were able to, through this digital transformation, automate a lot of that process, automate reminders to uh, families, patient families, and saw a dramatic reduction, uh, reduction in no-shows, which ultimately means increased work capacity, better workforce utilization, and ultimately uh, revenue and impact to their community. Now, that took us to about 25 minutes, which is just about perfect, so we'll wrap up, and we do have time for Q&A, so a nice reminder plug to ask any questions you do have in the chat. We'll get to as many as we can, and we will follow up afterwards if we can't. So on the left, to me, there were three key themes that really emerged in the conversations I had with home care professionals. The first is the importance of minimizing the logistical minutia, and that's really about empowering caregivers to provide the best care they can and avoid diluting their efficacy, which I again keep coming back to, by bogging them down with manual work and inefficient scheduling and things like routing. Uh, I imagine caregivers literally passing each other on the street or driving past their house over and over again to get to the same appointment, uh, which just doesn't make sense. It also comes down to things like prioritizing the caregiver experience, and that is a particularly important one, and it comes down to things like combating the high attrition that's so common in home care, with simple investments in the caregiver experience, workflow simplification, autonomy, and centralized communication. And not everything needs to be getting on the phone with a vendor. You could do this tomorrow just by facilitating a conversation with some of the caregivers. One of the organizations I spoke to had monthly lunches where they had folks from the field come in and they just had a workshop-based conversation around what's working, what's not, what do you guys like? And just simply feeling heard, I think, did a lot to help with their, uh, their attrition and employee satisfaction, but ultimately leads to actionable changes uh, in the way they manage care. And then last but certainly not least, simplifying the patient experience. And that's things like anticipating their needs, consistently matching caregivers based on their preferences, as we mentioned, automating appointment reminders, which we also flag, and then communicating early and often if there are changes. Now, this all begs the question, how do we actually put this in action? And I asked this question of folks I spoke to in the home care space and pattern matching across a few of those uh, conversations, I distill it down to an exercise where you could consider mapping your organization on a spectrum of maturity relative to the five challenges we spoke about in depth or any of the other challenges we flagged earlier in the conversation. And quite simply for things like telehealth preparedness, caregiver enablement, reimbursement, communication, both internal and external, data access and interoperability, uh, other themes around caregiver experience. How would you rate your organization's maturity on a scale of one to five? Where do you wanna be in six, 12, 18, 24 months? And then once you start to red, yellow, green that exercise, you can pattern match, identify the key pain points and start to figure out how you can uh, invest to develop those areas. If you're particularly bold, uh, you could even set out a survey to your employees, both internal on the operations or intake coordinator side, but also caregivers to better understand how they feel and maybe do a little pattern matching around how folks on the operations side versus the external uh, field side feel. So with that, I'd like to open it up for questions and I'm going to look over at the chat screen. All right, thank you, Michael. I think I'll jump in here too, just to help moderate some of these uh, questions that are coming in. Um, Thanks again for all that great information. As questions are rolling in, let's go ahead and start with this one. I think somebody's just asking for a little bit more clarity on what it is that Schedulo does exactly. Um, so could you kind of give the uh, elevator pitch of Schedulo, uh, so to speak? Sure, uh, great question, Bob. We actually, we anticipated that one. So I think I have some slides I can speak to, uh, but ultimately it's about managing deskless work, and that's quite literally the scheduling component primarily, engaging employees and your customers, and that's manifested in the form of the mobile application that we arm folks with, that every day you open up Schedulo on your uh, iPhone or your Android phone and figure out where do I need to go, how do I need to prepare for the day, what do I need to do to navigate, and, uh, and quite literally manage that throughout the day, execute work, view work details, capture photos, notes, uh, customer signatures and the like. 
And when things dynamically shift and an appointment gets canceled or one needs to get added, that can all occur in real time through that mobile application. And then there's an analyzed piece of the puzzle too. And actually, if I head forward a slide or two, um, generally this is the way we describe our product. So it's, so it's through a series of those pillars around manage, engage, and then analyze as well. How can you get better insight into things like appointment capacity, appointment execution trends, workforce utilization rates, how do those trend over time? And then it's all built on highly extensible and performant platform that ultimately allows you to integrate with a number of the solutions you see below, most relevant to this group, something like an EHR. Um, so this is kind of the exploded view, but we can definitely get into depth um, offline around that, but we appreciate the question. And I know we're close to time or at time, but I'm happy to go a few minutes over if there are a few more questions, Bob. Yeah, we, we do have a couple of more here. Uh... And you, you just mentioned EHR, so that's a good um, point to transition to this one. Somebody just wants to know, um, could you clarify a little bit, how is Schedulo different than our EHR? Sure, uh, great question. Um, so EHR generally handles things like the patient's health history, the record of care received, billing, collections, things of that nature, where Schedulo is a platform that's designed to manage your mobile caregivers, the availability of your patients, and ultimately that's about things like intelligently optimizing the, the way you match caregivers with patients. And of course, as I mentioned, Schedulo's mobile app gives caregivers the tool they need to do their job in real time in the field. And that's things like the ability to set and update their availability, to see and plan their schedule and travel time, to navigate the patient detail or patient locations, and to actually execute uh, the, the work itself. And still related to EHR, somebody's asking, my EHR has a built-in scheduling feature. How is Schedulo different than that? Sure. Uh, great question. That's definitely one uh, we've heard before. So what I would flag is the fact that EHRs have uh, core strengths around things like patient records and billings. Uh, and in fact, it's a great source of information, which is why Schedulo tends to integrate with EHRs. They tend not to be as proficient at things like uh, patient engagement or patient portals, automation, analytics, and that's where Schedulo comes in. We're more focused on the mobile workforce management um, piece, and we're trying to innovate in that space and apply learnings from other industries beyond healthcare, um, whereas EHRs might be slower to adopt to new technology and ultimately you know, I personally have no ego about this. An effective solution is the one that your staff loves and uses, but what we consistently hear, and I'm sure what you'd hear if you, uh, you know, spoke to folks around the office, is that staff generally doesn't love your EHR. <laughs> it's a great source of information, uh, but it doesn't necessarily make their lives all that easier. And that's where Schedulo comes in to interface and broker uh, the insights in something like an EHR and the actual execution uh, of work. And I, I actually had a question I wanted to send your way um, that I've been thinking about since the start of this conversation. Um, toward the beginning, you mentioned how there's this global underinvestment in the deskless workforce. Um, why, why do you think that is? And, and do you think that we're seeing that change at all? Because I do think in the past year, there has been more of a spotlight um, shining on the deskless workforce. Yeah, that's a good question, Bob. I appreciate you uh, <laughs> you throwing a curveball too. Um, yeah, I do think it is changing. I do think one of the silver linings of COVID-19 is just the light it shown, uh, uh, it, or it does shine on, continues to shine on frontline work. And the reality is not everyone sits behind a desk every day. And in fact, the staggering statistic that folks like me are outnumbered four to one by folks yeah. that don't sit behind a desk every day. So I think it is being recognized. I do think that was one of the silver linings in COVID. And the bigger question after we recognize how large uh, that population is, is how do we enable them? And how do we offer this, I almost think of it as digital transformation for the rest of us, um, which was one of the appealing parts of joining Schedulo, uh, which I did just under a year ago and uh, bringing some of those insights that folks who do work in an office have been thinking about for the better part of two decades to folks uh, in the field that may have been overlooked or underserved uh, by the tech community. Thank you. And I think we'll try to sneak in one more question before wrapping up. This is a really straightforward one. Somebody's asking, 
Is your company focusing specifically within the health slash caregiver field or to schedule a work with other industries as well? Sure, uh, great question. So we certainly work with other industries. We have a, uh, a rich uh, library or a rich set of customers in the healthcare space. And it's certainly one of our most strategic verticals and where we do see uh, a lot of relationships being built and a lot of product development that's oriented towards better serving that community. Uh, what's interesting is even within the healthcare space, you have sub segments that are wildly different from one another. I mean, home care is uh, is very different than say labs and diagnostics is different than uh, maybe rehab and therapy, for instance. So uh, it's a widely varied field in and of itself, but we do work with a number of other industries including everything from utilities, real estate, construction, solar, nonprofit, uh, and a long tail of others for sure. All right, well, thank you so much for your time today. I do think that this is a good point to wrap things up. Um, and thank you again to Schedulo for making today's conversation possible. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add before we do say goodbye to our attendees here? Sure, thanks, Bob. First of all, thanks for the opportunity to join and speak today. And then also just a sincere thank you to everyone that tuned in. Uh, this is a space I'm particularly passionate about. I think it's critically important, particularly in the age of COVID. And if you have perspectives or commentary or reactions to anything we shared today, mgleason, G-L-E-A-S-O-N, at schedulo.com, would love to hear from you and hope that what we presented is useful to you and good luck in your journey.